we all know we need gauges when we're driving our vehicles. I mean, that kind of tells us what's going on with the vehicle, right? Oil pressure, water temperature, uh, alternator, you know, charging system, kind of important things. So when we bought a truck that nothing worked on, it was time to do something about it. So we thought, why not make a video on it? So we pulled the cluster out of this 2003 Silverado, just gonna be a shop truck for us. And uh, odometer wasn't working, the Prindle or the park reverse neutral drive uh, selector light up wasn't working. Uh, none of the gauges were working, uh, not the mile per hour, not the RPMs, uh, not the uh, oil pressure, water temperature, anything, fuel even. We had no idea how much fuel was in it, no idea how fast we were driving, didn't know how many RPMs the motor was turning. So very important to get that fixed. Now it did illuminate, but that was about it. And we knew that it had been worked on because there were blue lights in it. So pretty cool that it lit up blue, but that was the only thing it did. And we knew, oh no, somebody's been in this before. So anyway, we had our suspicions that there were probably some problems. These early G, I say early GM, early 2000 GM dashboards had a lot of issues. Um, and even earlier back into the late nineties as well. And really anybody since the electronics have started showing up in the dashboards and things, there's problems with them. As they age, as they get older, the more miles that are put on them, uh, the more abuse they get put through, especially when they start customizing things and you never know what's gonna happen there. And they have issues. Now, a new one is about 500 bucks, if I'm not mistaken. I think to get it repaired, you're gonna be in the 100 to $300 range. So we thought, why not show you how to do this? Uh, whether you wanna do this as a service or whether you wanna do it for yourself, um, maybe it'll help you out, maybe it won't. So. First thing we did was pulled it out of the vehicle. Pretty easy to do. We actually walked through all that. So we'll roll into that. And then we're gonna get into actually dismantling this and actually digging in and finding the actual broken solder joints um, that we figured we would find, but they were a lot harder to find than you would suspect. So I definitely recommend like some magnifying glasses. The uh, magnifying glasses, you can pick them up on Amazon for pretty cheap. And you know, with LED light, it's, light on, it's gonna help illuminate what you're looking at. Also a little plastic pry tool is very handy. I would stay away from a metal one when you're prying off those needles. Um, and as well as a little precision screwdriver, a little flat blade screwdriver, and then some tweezers or a little, you know, kind of set of fine needle nose pliers will help as well, uh, just to be able to hold those little um, uh, electronics as they possibly can break loose. Uh, and then a soldering iron, and you want something, you know, we've got several soldering irons in the shop from plug-in models that, you know, look like the gun, the old Weller style, which are great to have, um, but again, much, most of the time overkill a lot of stuff. Uh, and then even some of the portable units, which are great battery powered stuff, but again, kind of a pain um, when you're trying to move around small electronics. That's why I wanted something like a wand style. I really like the Ryobi because it's hybrid. You can, it's battery powered, you can put it anywhere. Uh, you can also adjust the temperature on it. So I don't have to have it at 750 degrees or 900 degrees. I, I can take it to 900 if I need to, uh, but I can put it about halfway at you know, 450, 500 degrees. Uh, seems pretty good when you're using some real fine solder. I felt like a little above halfway is kind of where it worked best. So I would say it was probably in the 500 degree range. Also, I can change the tips out to a precision tip or a, a flat tip or whatever I need to on this. So that worked out very well. So let's get into it. Okay, what we have here is a gauge cluster in a 2003 Silverado, but again, much the same as, as a lot of the GM, uh, at least the truck and SUV platforms. Uh, even the, some of the uh, full-size passenger cars are still a lot the same. Um, the first thing we want to do, um, first let me show you kind of what problems we're having. So you can see when I turn on the key, no gauges move whatsoever. The RPMs are up at about 500 and they stayed there, they're not moving. Um, I get air conditioner controls, I get controls on my, on my uh, four wheel drive, everything else. But again, everything on the dash cluster basically does not work. Now the illumination works, um, so the lights actually come on, but nothing on the needles are actually moving at all. Even when we crank it up, nothing. No RPM input, uh, no temperature input, no oil pressure, battery, anything like that. So we've obviously got a problem with the cluster. Um, again, we're getting power to it because the lights are coming on. So it's not a, a fuse issue or anything. We still get a few indicator lamps. Um, but not the majority of them and definitely not any of the uh, stepper motors on the actual gauges themselves. So first thing we want to do here in, in the GM is we want to pull the steering wheel all the way down, which I've got that. 
Um, and then we want to pull the, uh, uh, the gear shift selector all the way down as well. We just basically want it out of our way because we're going to pull this uh, bezel off, if you will. Um, so then we just want to grab this, and these are all clips. There's no screws that need to be taken out. Once those are out, you can just pretty much lean this forward, and this comes out really easily. Again, just be careful with them. Um, usually they pop out pretty easily. Sometimes they'll break if they're old, but this one's over 10 years old, no problem. Um, now we can, well, let's leave this down. And then basically we've, we've got seven millimeter bolts that are holding these in. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna take my seven millimeter. Just be careful here if you are using a power tool like I am. So there's four of those, two on each side. Now we should be able to reach up in here and you see this is basically your only wiring right here. Um, so you can see right here and then basically we want to squeeze because the top and bottom you actually like you can see this blue latch here. There's a gray one on the other side. So we want to squeeze here and just kind of rock it back and forth and it should pull right out for you without any problem. Again, so there's sometimes you see these they'll be blue um, sometimes they're gray as you see here so now we can return this back and turn it off and by the way you want to do that you want to take as little time as possible because on the GM's your fan motor will still run when it's in the run position your lights will illuminate your auto uh, your auto headlights will turn on um, so it's a good thing to either turn those off or to return it back to the off position as soon as you can. You can probably even take the key out, make sure you're not getting any buzzing or anything like that. So here's the cluster. Um, we're gonna actually take this to the workbench, pull this thing apart and uh, see what we find. Okay, so we've got our instrument cluster over here on the workbench. Um, and before we take this apart, I would suspect what we're gonna find is some bad solder, not necessarily solder connections, but probably some broken solder joints. Um, another thing, there's some telltale signs that uh, this has been into before. Uh, I can just tell that, you know, some of these clips are not in the best shape. Um, but the main thing was when we turned on the lights, these were all blue. That's just not from the factory. So I know this has been into before. The only way to get to the instrument cluster lights is to pull it apart like we're doing now. Um, so I know this has been into, and I'm telling you, we're probably going to find some crack solder joints and maybe even some bad solder joints if they actually tried to fix it prior to. So we're gonna look for that. A Couple of tools you're gonna to need. So small screwdriver, uh, maybe even a micro screwdriver if you want to. And then I like having a little plastic pry tool. You can pull these uh, um, needles off with your fingers if you want to, but I like having just a little pry behind it. And I like it plastic because you are gonna be kind of prying off the, off the face of the gauges if you can't pull those off. Uh, easily and by the way you want to know where your needles are because you're going to replace those and those stepper motors will kind of return back to where they were um, they have some memory to them um, so anyway so uh, let's dig into it and see what we find first thing we want to do is to pull off the back clips first so and as you do this you want to kind of keep pressure applied because they'll want to return back so now we've got those three let's go up here to the front Okay, and that's all there is to it. So that's all there is taking the back off are those uh, three clips there, three clips on the bottom, and the four clips on the top. Very easy to pry those off. You don't, it doesn't take a lot of prying to do. By the way, keep you a clean, I've got a, a paper towel and a clean rag, but you know, again, you're, you're getting into the inside of your cluster. Once you get it back together, there's gonna be no cleaning it. So if you do have to wipe or something, make sure that you have a clean rag or a clean paper towel um, or both as we see here. So now we've got internal clips that we need to mess with. First, we can get these external ones. Same as the front. That one popped back in. Got those. 
And then what we have back here, be careful not try. This will this will try to move around on you. And again, you've got the needle still present on the on that face, so you don't want to move it too much or let it move too much. Some of these things can be a pain. So I'm going to grab a precision screwdriver, a little micro screwdriver, if you will. So you want to pry on the back side of that tab. I'll show you here in just one moment. And that one's in. So let me go ahead and. this in there and then we want to get this one so again so we'll see that tab and we want to be on that side of the tab here push it towards you push that little black tab and there we go so we'll see here you see these two black tabs right here that actually pop in and I'll show you again in one moment where they pop where they actually pop into so let's now release our top ones these basically pop back into place after we there we go. So now basically our clear, clear lens will come off. And so now we're down to the nitty gritty where we can see our actual dash. You see these needles. And again, we can pull these needles off just by pulling them straight up. But like I mentioned, I like to use a little tool here and just pull them straight up. You can break these, so be careful with them. I'm just going straight under it. Up. All right, so now we've got a nice smooth uh, front besides this thing sticking out there, which is our uh, clearing of our, of our mileage for, the, uh, for your trip mileage. Um, and this is where if you want to change these faces out to a white face, you can do so. Um, it's also where your illumination is and things like that. But let's go ahead and lift this off. And so there you have it. That's the, there's the guts right there. Um, so this is the front side. These are what they call stepper motors. And you see they're all identical from your, they're all X27. So from your speedometer to your RPMs to your oil, water, everything else is basically electronics that's actually feeding it the information it needs. Uh, there's what they call your Prindle or your park reverse neutral drive. Um, this is 321, but usually uh, uh, has a low park, or drive. park reverse neutral drive and low. Um, in this case, again, they got the 321. And this is where your driver's in for information cluster is. It'll give you information as well as where your odometer reads. So right now, you could not tell how many miles were on the car. You could not tell what gear you were in, nor did any of the gauges work. Um, and then you can see here where these LEDs have been replaced. Um, are now shining blue, um, which is interesting. I figured they would have gone with a different route. Um, but anyway, it is what it is. Let's try to find what the issues are now. What a lot of times happens is on these small little capacitors here, a lot of times you can find weaknesses or cracks. You can see some hot spots for sure. You can see how white this is and then how discolored it is around here, very yellowish and around here. So that could be some overheating. Um, but then you want to probably take a magnifying glass and just kind of look through here and uh, look at these different capacitors here um, that are on this board. Um, and see if you can find any broken uh, solder joints or any uh, you know odd looking ones and then the other rough spot is right here where it plugs in and you can see some discoloration here as well so we'll dig in and kind of magnify that and and, uh, and see what we can find there so this has got me thinking quite a bit because usually what we'll find here are um, you know little broken uh, solder joints here where these little uh, diodes are I think I called them capacitors earlier. Um, I'm not an electronics expert by any means. Um, like I mentioned, they have replaced these LEDs, but they did a pretty good job. They really didn't overheat anywhere, so that wasn't the issue. I thought that might be an issue. Um, look back here. Most of these solder joints look okay, and I just kind of like glanced over all the rest of these solder joints, and again, it looks okay. Um, all the clear, they, they put like a clear shellac um, from the factory over this. Uh, that's really not melted away here. Um, so not seeing any bad spots there where somebody's kind of gone at it with a with a soldering iron. 
Um, so it really looks in good shape. Now, in between, took some searching with some magnifying glasses to actually find this. It looks like somebody must have soldered here and these two solder pin, the, the solder between these two pins are touching. Now, if I'm not mistaken, those two pins there, one of them's ground and I believe one of them is oil pressure sender or something, let's see here. Anyway, so we're gonna go in and try to clean up that little solder joint between those two and see if we can't fix this thing. By the way, I like the Ryobi for this because I know there are some smaller, um, uh, like portable soldering irons, um, but they don't have temperature control on them. So, you know, whether that's gas or you, you have really no idea with gas, um, and then even, even with your cordless tools, and again, you, you really don't have a, a temperature selection on this. Whereas on this one, I can, you know, vary that selection between 400 and 900 degrees. Um, and I'm gonna go about halfway here. So that's one thing I really like about the Ryobi is I, I've got some ability to do so. Now, since I'm actually just gonna be pulling some solder off, I'm really not gonna to, uh, to prime the tip or to tin the tip on this. It, it's already tinned a little bit, but I'm not gonna put any additional solder on it or it would wanna lay that down. So I'm just gonna try to draw some of this up and uh, remove that solder between these two pins. By the way, I'm also wearing some magnifying lenses here. Okay, the green light here tells us that we're up to temp. And by the way, I don't know if you've seen this soldering iron. We actually did a review on it. You can run this, it's a hybrid model. You can run it on a battery um, or you can actually plug it in here as well. So you can actually plug an extension cord into it or you can uh, run it on a battery. By the way, now I've got to turn it back on. There we go. Should go green here in a second. There we go, we're green, so we're good to go. So let's see if we can't wick up some of this solder. It's definitely connected. Um, there was some uh, number six and number seven pin had a solder piece between them. Um, I cleaned that up uh, and kind of wicked that, that solder joint out. But flipping back over here, you can actually look at this and I'll pull a magnifying glass out and there's broken solder joints on these small uh, diodes here. Um, whatever they are, not capacitors, not diodes, but anyway, um, on these uh, components right here, there are cracked solder joints there. Can't see it with the naked eye. I've even got a pair of magnifying glasses wherever they went to. Um, could barely see them. I mean, at a hard stare, I could finally see them showing up. So several of these have cracks in the solder. So we're gonna touch those up and then go from there and see what happens. But first, what I'm gonna do, I cut a couple of small pieces of wood, just kind of show you that you don't need anything uh, really technical. And then basically I'm gonna put it on here and put a small one inch drywall screw and I'm not going to tighten it down tight but put some legs on this so I can flip this thing over or, or set this thing here down here where I can actually work on it without uh, all that stuff hitting the ground or having to lean it up against something or what have you. You could probably just lay it on a rubber mat as well but anyway that's what I'm going to do. So like I mentioned I just took a couple of pieces of wood you could take dowel or whatever and I used some holes just make sure the holes don't have any you know pins and solder uh, where you're putting these actual legs. A um, little bit of solder won't bad, but wouldn't be bad, but again, make sure there's no pins sticking up or what have you. And then again, I put screws, you know, in places uh, that really don't matter or, you know, there's no connectors, if you will. So that now I can set this up and work on it and nothing's touching metal, nothing's grounding out or anything like that. So I've got my soldering iron, uh, again, probably set, I don't know, somewhere, not quite the middle, so somewhere around probably 450, 500 degrees. Um, and uh, not sure what temperature I should actually be at, but again, I know I don't need it really hot. And I've got some fine solder as well. Could probably even give you a little bit finer than this. And I'm just gonna basically touch up um, these solder joints here and uh, see if we can't remedy the issue.
Okay, so uh, what we thought the issue were, was, uh, at least after we really dug in and could see, was basically uh, cracks in the solder on these uh, small um, little diodes and uh, electronic components, what have you. So basically we just went through and re-soldered each of these connections. My first couple were a little bit ugly, uh, but we got in the, the roll of things. I probably should have had a lot more precision tip on this. Um, I probably should have changed the tip out for a finer tip. But anyway, um, doing these finer electronics as well as probably using a little bit thinner of uh, some solder and make sure you're using resin core solder as well. Uh, anyhow, uh, so we've got it fixed. Um, put it in the truck there, you know, bare bones and uh, see if it lit up. It all lit up, even the park reverse neutral drive uh, 321 um, or Prindle as they call it. Uh, as well as the odometer, and we saw how many miles are on this, which is a lot. Um, so let's get this thing back together and truly get it in the truck and uh, see how we go from there. By the way, once we turn the vehicle off and those stepper motors are turned back to zero, try not to knock those, um, and uh, we'll see if we can't get those needles in the right spot. And this is where you want to make sure that you're lining up here. Basically, you have two different style needles here. You have the, uh, the RPM and the uh, mile per hour, which are identical. Um, and again, we want to kind of make sure that we are at zero when we put these on. Looks pretty good. Now, I'm going to go and take it this way and go put it in the vehicle because we know that we can just uh, clip this back on once it's in the truck. I'm going to validate, verify that, that our needle's in the right spot. But these are the clips here that were a little bit more of a pain. Um, by the way, I've seen people literally reach under here and just hit it with their fingers. Um, but anyway, you see how a little, little bit different than the others. Uh, this tab actually, this tab right here actually slides inside there and locks right there. Um, so that's kind of how that works. So. Anywho, we'll do that, like I said, after that's in the vehicle and slide that back together. So we'll go ahead and just put on the face. Okay, so we got the cluster done. It's all finished. Let's put this thing in so we'll bring our shift selector all the way down put it in put in the plug actually go top in first that's how we took it out there we go There you have it. Let's again confirm. Back and dry. So again, we're good on everything. I think we're with the RPMs, five, six hundred RPM. It may be, it may supposed to be a little higher than that. Um, oil pressure is not working. I think temperature is good. Fuel as well as the. Uh, the battery may show charging a little more than normal, but we'll check all that out with a scope and then uh, come back and adjust for it. So back on. Clips are all in. There we go. So that's it. Pretty simple process, actually. Pulling it out is easy. Putting it back in is easy. I mean, we're talking four bolts and you know some clips. That's about it. Uh, as far as getting into it, uh, maybe a little difficult, but really not that troubled. That much trouble to get in. Be careful when you pry those needles off. And then again, the soldering. Just maybe find somebody with a little bit of electronics experience if you don't understand how to solder or practice on something and then kind of once you work your way back into it it got pretty smooth to kind of touch up all those joints but pretty simple to do save quite a bit of money 
or like I said, you may be able to charge for this as well. Customers come in with problems on their dash, whether it's LED lights out, whether they want to change the lights, or whether they want to just pay you to get the gauges fixed. There you have it. So anyway, make sure you follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I hope this helped you out. If it did, hit that like and subscribe button. Have a great day and go out and do something nice for someone.